So the, the main things I was going to go over with regards to the, the basics of binocular vision and the, what you really have to, the core understanding comes from retinal con correspondence, the grades of binocular vision, how we assess binocular vision, and then a little bit of a, a delving into ocular motility, which is um, often a little bit, um, yeah, a bit, a bit tricky for some, some people that aren't doing it every day. So if we go into non, uh, retinal correspondence first, uh, Tori, if you could change slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so normal retinal correspondence um, obviously is stimulation of corresponding retinal points. So in normal circumstances, stimulation of the fovea in both eyes corresponds to straight ahead. Stimulation of um, nasal retina corresponds to temporal visual field, temporal retina, nasal, nasal visual field, superior is inferior field, and inferior is your superior visual field. And really understanding that, you understand that you can do a bv <laughs> nothing nothing's complicated after that um so we then start to think about when bv goes wrong and we've got um squints and things involved so if you move on to the next slide Victoria. so in an esotropia obviously the eye is in a convergent position so instead of stimulating the phobia it would stimulate a nasal retinal point now this could as i said this corresponds to temporal retina so this results in um homonymous or uncrossed diplopia and um, that's where it is on the same side as the manifest uh, eye in an exotropia it obviously stimulates your temporal retina so you get this cross diplopia, where if you've got a manifest X on the right eye, then the crossed image of the diplopic image will be on the left hand side of the true image um, or the real image, so to speak. Next slide. So that's where binocular single vision um, comes from. So you've got the um, this Pan Am's fusional area and the, the heropter. So any image falling on the heropter will stimulate corresponding retinal points in both eyes and result in a single image and give rise to binocular single vision. There is, however, this area of um, a grey area, so to speak, where it might not be tricked, it might not stimulate both of the, the points on the heropter, but if it's within this Pan Am's fusional area, then you can still give rise to binocular single vision because it's within close enough proximity to the heropter and close enough proximity to the other eye that you still get this binocular single vision. Now, for binocular single vision to develop, um, it's on there's an understanding that you have to have normal retinal correspondence, you have to have crossing of the nasal retinal fibres at the optic chiasm, you have to have an overlap of the visual fields, and you have to have normal anatomical development of both the eyes and the uh, occipital cortex to give rise to binocular single vision. Next slide. So when it all goes wrong and you get um, abnormal retinal correspondence, this is where, like you can see in the image on the, on the right eye, the the corresponding point for the fovea of the left eye is corresponding to a slightly parafoveal point in the right eye. Um, and this gives rise to abnormal retinal correspondence where the brain is still able to simultaneously perceive the two images from each eye, but they don't correspond to the, the normal anatomical part. So it's not the fovea of the right eye and the left eye that are corresponding to one another. This is a sensory adaptation that results in the presence of a manifest strabismus. Now, it usually has to be a manifest squint that's less than about 20 diopters in measurement to get abnormal retinal correspondence. I have seen them up to about 30. Anything bigger than that is just, it's just not going to happen. Um, and it is a, an adaptation to eliminate double vision and usually only happens if the squint is um, onset at a very early age. Um, now, it was previously thought we were talking very early age, as in, you know, the first kind of year when, you know, stereopsis develops at about approximately 35 weeks. So it was previously thought that the, the squint had to be present at that stage to develop this abnormal retinal correspondence. But there are some children that who, who show abnormal retinal correspondence, even um, kind of two to three years down, down the line, developing a small manifest squint. So um, the timing of onset isn't overly relevant, but... Um, the size of the squint that you develop is, is the most important factor in determining whether or not abnormal retinal correspondence is likely to develop. Next slide. 
So if you don't get abnormal retinal correspondence, um, but you do have a squint, then there's a, a varying degree of other things that can go wrong. So double vision is the most common one um, that we're aware of. And this results from this stimulation of non-corresponding retinal points. So you still have the manifest squint, you still have the stimulation of the nasal or temporal retina, assuming it's an easel or an exotropia, but it no longer um, projects to straight ahead in the brain. So the brain no longer recognises the image as being in the same place in both eyes, and it results in double vision, either crossed or uncrossed, depending on whether it's easel or exo. What a lot of patients sometimes complain of, though, instead of diplopia, is actually confusion. This is where they see the two images that correspond to straight ahead. So they see the two image, images being stimulated, uh, the phobia is stimulating one on top of the other. So they don't actually perceive diplopia, but they do perceive um, what we call confusion. So the, the image being stimulated off centre appears um, on top of the um, straight ahead position and that, that results in confusion. It's less commonly reported, but patients find it a wee bit more difficult to articulate when they do have it. Next slide. So um, one of the other things that we're often faced with, particularly when we have a strabismus that develops in infancy, is uh, suppression. So suppression, to, to a certain extent, suppression is a good thing because it prevents the plopia and confusion, obviously. Um, so again, it's a, it's a neurophysiological mechanism where the brain inhibits the stimulus on one retina to prevent either diplopia or confusion. Now, suppression is a little bit of a tricky one to, to comprehend, particularly when you're trying to explain it to patients, because the eye's not, it's not that the eye's not being used. So it's not that it completely blocks out everything that's coming into that eye. It just blocks out the areas that are causing uh, the problem. So you still, you get foveal uh, suppression to get rid of the confusion and you can also get nasal or temporal suppression to eliminate the diplopia so if it was like we were saying in the easels next so because they stimulate different parts of the retina it's only that part of the retina that's suppressed so the rest of the visual field still develops which is why you don't have complete field loss um it's not but it's very easy to explain it to a parent as well that the brain just doesn't use that eye but that's um, a very kind of loose way of speaking about it um and sometimes can be a bit misunderstood by parents. And again, a little bit like developing abnormal retinal correspondence, the development of suppression um, is usually only when we develop a strabismus in um, early infancy. It, it does sometimes occur in adulthood, but I think in adulthood, it's more a case of ignoring the double vision as opposed to a true uh, suppression of the retina. Um, it's more that the, the, the adults just adapt to it um, and it's unlikely to develop um, over the age of about 10. You're unlikely to develop suppression if you develop a manifest squint at that age. Next slide. So now that we, um, we've got the grasp of um, retinal correspondence and things, it, there's obviously there's the three grades of BV. Now, this is a wee bit of a an old fashioned way of looking at it, to be honest, it's not really taught us three grades of BV anymore, but I still think it's um, it's a really good way to get your head around it. Um, so sense diffusion is just the ability um, to appreciate two images that are in the same uh, position and they're stimulating the same part of both eyes or corresponding parts of both eyes and you interpret it as one. The right eye sees it, left eye sees it and um, you interpret it as one. Motor fusion is the ability to maintain sensory fusion over a range of um, convergent and divergent positions. So um, when you're latent deviations, easels and exophorias, the brain still has the ability to maintain a single image. Or when we're um, moving, if you perform a version movement and we fix on a target to the side, you quickly get, you know, you get that single vision back before you realise that there's a lapse because of, of motor fusion. Um, the presence or absence of fusion, particularly motor fusion, um, indicates prognosis in the management of any strabismus, whether that be um, conservative management or um, surgical Botox management of strabismus. Um, motor fusion is, gives us a good indicator of long-term prognosis when we're um, considering any management options.
And then obviously the stereopsis, so your, your depth perception, <laughs> um, which is just the ability to appreciate depth um, in a 3D image. Victoria, thank you. <laughs> um, so when we're assessing binocular vision, it's often thought that you just do the, the three grades of binocular vision, but actually when we're doing an investigation of binocular vision and when we're trying to determine a patient's binocular status, you need to take into consideration um, the history, so the onset and the time of the strabismus, um, the refractive error that the patient has, the level of vision that the patient has, and obviously your cover test results. So um, whether there's a manifest deviation, whether they complain of diplopia in the presence of the manifest deviation or or not. Next slide. So I'm not entirely sure how um, in community practice uh, sensory fusion would be investigated. Now, obviously, if the patient tells you they've got double vision, they've got double vision, that's quite an easy one. Um, but quite often, monocular diplopia is confused with binocular diplopia. And that's where a test like this um, would come in really handy. Now, sometimes it's as easy as you cover up one eye. Yeah, it's still double. Well, obviously it's monocular. Um, but using something like Baglini glasses or Worth's lights, that's what we would use in a hospital eye setting. Um, and you can see the range protected with Baglini glasses. The top two options there are diplopia responses. You've got your BSV response in the middle. Bottom left is uh, supposed to indicate central suppression, and the bottom right is suppression of one eye. And obviously, the line would go the other way if it's the, the other eye that's been suppressed. Um, now, what we'd say about the one that indicates central suppression is I can tell you with 100% certainty in my career so far, nobody has ever given me that response um, because the ability to tell you that there's a tiny little gap missing um, it doesn't happen. Um, but that is apparently a response that you might get if the patient's got central suppression. The other one that we commonly use, which is a wee bit easier for um, patients to interpret what they're seeing and depends less on the clinician examining them with the words, uh, with Baglini glasses, the position of your pen torch can really affect the result you get. Um, but with the Worth's lights, it's a wee bit more, um, it's easier for patients to tell you the, the response that they're seeing with regards to the, the number of lights and the colour of lights that they're seeing. Um, the only difficulty is if it's a child that doesn't know colour or if it's a colour vision deficit, obviously that becomes a bit of an issue. But that's the two, two common ones that we would use in, in clinical practice. What I would say is if my patient doesn't have a manifest deviation and the, um, yeah, if they don't have a manifest deviation, I can see a latent deviation, we just skip sensory fusion. We make an assumption that we know they've got it. We don't investigate it to, to prove they've got it. We just make that uh, an assumption and we move on to assessing motor fusion. Next slide. So being able to investigate motor fusion, particularly with the use of a prism reflex test, is really beneficial for young children who come in with query strabismus that it looks as though they're probably a pseudostrabismus. If you can demonstrate that they have the presence of motor fusion, then you can be quite confident that at that moment in time, even if you can't get very much else out of them, they're probably not squinting. Now, the, the prism reflex test is where you would put a, usually most commonly a 20 diopter base out prism over one eye. Because the image is shifted onto temporal retina, it causes an inward movement of the eye to take up foveal fixation. The inward movement of the eye, because of Herring's law of equal innervation, that stimulation of the medial recti in one eye stimulates the lateral rectus of the other eye, and the other eye goes out. Because this then results in diplopia, because you're getting corresponding, you're getting stimulation of a, a non-corresponding point, you then get a refixation movement of the, the eye that's gone out to come back in to take up um, central fixation again. That that full process is the process of overcoming a 20 diopter prism. You can also, you would then also repeat the process and put the prism over the other eye. And if they don't do it with a 20, you can reduce your prism strength to a 15 or a 10. It does just tell you that the grade of binocular vision is maybe not quite, or the level of motor fusion is maybe not quite as strong, but it still confirms the presence of motor fusion. Uh, you would use a near target, I've just seen Hazel's ask the question, you would use a near target at approximately 33 centimetres 
anything that doesn't stimulate, so something that stimulates fovea or parafovea, you don't really want anything that stimulates paramacular region um, because it's just too big a target. Um, you can also use a four diopter test for as a prism reflex test. Now this doesn't, if you have a, the inability to overcome a four diopter, it works in the same theory, but a patient not overcoming a four diopter doesn't tell you they've not got motor fusion, but it does tell you that they may have central suppression. So um, in those ones that it's just one area um, where they've eliminated for, to eliminate confusion, you can get central suppression and a four diopter would confirm that. This is something you might get in like a microtropia. For a four diopter test, you have to use the smallest target that the patient is likely to be able to see based on their visual acuity. Now, if you've got to the point in practice that you're assessing a four diopter to check for a microtropia or check for central suppression, your patient's probably going to be wee, a wee bit more cooperative than your 12 month old pseudostrabismus. So um, you should be able to get an idea of their level of acuity. And it's just the smallest target that their best seeing eye is likely to be able to see that you would use for a four diopter. Uh, next slide. So obviously the, the 20 diopter is a quick way of establishing whether or not a patient has um, motor fusion, but it doesn't tell us the quality of their motor fusion and it doesn't tell us their ability to control an underlying deviation. And that's where fusional amplitudes come in. Now, we still have textbook norms for fusional amplitudes and this is what they are, but I would interpret what these uh, textbook values are with a pinch of salt, to be honest. Um, but this is what the textbook says normal should be. So for, for base out, you should be able to get 35 base out to 15 base in at near, 15 base out, 7 base in. So approximately half in the distance of what you would expect to be able to achieve at near. And for vertical, three, three up and three down. Um, and again, cycle th three exo and three in cycle torsion. Particularly the vertical values for norm, very few people can achieve three if they've not got an underlying vertical deviation. Most people decompensate after about one, maybe two at a push, um, but very few people have, have up to three. Um, now these are very beneficial because if your patient, for example, at a quick 20 diopter, tells you that they've got um, positive relative vergence. But if your patient has an easel, you need to know if they've got negative relative vergence. So you need to be able to assess their base in. And because the base in value is less than 20, it's much easier to assess fusional amplitudes where you start at the lowest prism strength and increase it until the patient decompensates. But you can assess um, blood break recovery as well, which is something that, that you're sometimes um, referred to with regards to the motor. But really the most important point is the point that they break at and how easily they recover. Um, if they break at 10 and they recover at eight, it doesn't matter. If they break at 10 and they don't recover at all, then obviously clinically, then that's, that's quite significant because once they have decompensated, they're going to find it really difficult to get it back. Um, you can also use a synoptophore to, to assess motor fusion, but I don't think any of you will have one of them in practice and actually in the hospital. It's a bit of um, historic equipment that we don't get out very often either. So, um, but just a point of note, if anybody ever hears about one, that it can be used to assess um, motor fusion as well. Yep, next slide, Victoria, thank you. Um, so just on that note, thinking about um, the relationship between your prism fusion range and your cover test and your prism cover test results. So in this uh, patient here, um, they've got a minimal esophoria at near, measures two, and a slight esophoria in the distance that measures 10. So based on the, the values we've got there, can we, can we do a poll, Victoria? A yes or a no um, poll? What do we think of the chances of the patient decompensating? based on their, their measurements there. So yes, they're going to decompensate or no, they're not. They've got sufficient fusion, fusion is the question. Sorry, I can't find my little bar. Oh, here it is. It's come up. You guys can't see the results, can you, as, as they're coming in live? I, I can see them. Can you? Okay. Yeah, I can see them. I don't know if anybody else can see them, but I can see them, so that's fine. <laughs> that's a good um, 
good result though, isn't it? I'll share it just in a minute. I'll just wait for the last, if there's 10 of you that still need to vote. That's great, it's getting up there. <laughs> okay, I will, I will share this. There you go. So uh, yeah, so results are in and actually it is quite a nice result because there's almost a 50-50 split between the people that think that the patient is going to decompensate and uh, the people that think the patient's not going to decompensate. Now, I would hedge my bets that they probably are, um, particularly for distance fixation. So at near, they've got a two diopter esophoria and we're looking at their base in uh, value. So their base end value tells you whether or not they have sufficient measurement, sufficient fusion to control the latent deviation. So they have eight diopters of base end fusion. So they should quite comfortably be able to control a two diopter esophoria. In the distance, however, they measure 10. So they are already controlling the 10, but they only have approximately two diopters of um, additional reserve capacity. So when we measure fusional amplitudes, we're measuring the fusional reserves. They're already controlling the latent deviation and we are measuring what they can control on top of that. So because they can only control an additional two, the little one in brackets is the point that they recover at. And um, so it's not overly important to you guys. Um, they are at a high risk of decompensating. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'd want to rush in there and give them a prism or something like that, but particularly if they're not symptomatic, if they're an asymptomatic patient at this point, um, I wouldn't do anything, but obviously this patient is complaining of diplopia in the distance when they're tired. So depending on the circumstances, you could either give them a prism for a bit of symptomatic relief, or we could look at improving their binocular status instead of just, I, I sometimes think of prisms like putting a, 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 I was going to say a band-aid, but I'm not American, uh, it's like putting a plaster on something um, it doesn't actually fix the underlying problem. So you could look at a way of improving their binocular status um, to help them control the deviation as opposed to just um, masking the problem with a prism. I could get the next slide, Victoria. So the kind of last um, grade of stereoacuity is, uh, of BV is their stereoacuity. Um, in, in, in the hospital setting, I tend to use a Frisbee because I think it's quite fun um, in comparison to some of the others. So particularly for the kids, um, it, it's, it's good and it's engaging for them. It's good for the kids that you can't get to cooperate at the start for a wee game to play to kind of settle them down. Or for the ones that have done well, it's something nice to finish on and requires a little bit less um, intense concentration for them. But there are a lot of different methods, I think, um, Worst fly, is, worst fly is something that's probably used quite a lot in um, optometry practices. The thing about a, a LANG and a TNO um, and anything that requires glasses comparative to a Frisbee is they don't actually check the same type of stereoacuity. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because they've either got stereoacuity or, or, or they've not. But the ones that require the use of um, like a TNO or works fly or something, they are, are more difficult to do, despite the fact that they give similar results in terms of the stereoacuity measurement, they are a more difficult test to do. They measure almost a clinical level of stereoacuity, whereas Frisbee measures more like a real life depth perception because in a Frisbee, it's literally just the picture that's coming towards you is printed on the front of the plate. And the picture that's back is printed on the back of the plate. So it is true depth um, as opposed to stereoacuity. So sometimes you, you find that children or adults are able to do a, a Frisbee, but they're not able to do um, a kind of more difficult stereoacuity test. And it gives you an idea of how they function in the real world, as well as a, a clinical picture of what they're doing. Right, next slide. Ooh. Sorry, there you go. All right. So I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of um, different patients with different binocular status. Does anybody have anything they wanted to ask about anything I've just said before I move on to that? Or are we quite happy? I'll take that as a... Quite, I'll take the silences, they're quite happy. Um, so patient we've got here, um, 
just a, a, a nondescript patient, really. They've got vision of um, 0.1 right and left eye, which equates to 6, 7.5 snellen equivalent for anybody that doesn't use Logmar. Um, and they've got a slight exophoria with good recovery, near and distance with their glasses on. Um, obviously, we always assess their binocular status with their full refractive correction. We don't, don't really care how they are without them. We just tell them to wear their glasses and we assess how they are with them. Um, so a patient gives a, a cross response on Bagolini glasses. They have overcome um, a 20 diopter with either eye and they've recovered from it well. And they get 100 seconds of arc on, on Frisbee. Um, can we do another poll, Victoria, just with options one, two, three, and four? So the options really are, does the patient have normal binocular single vision? Do they have abnormal binocular single vision? Do they have abnormal retinal correspondence or do they suppress? So we have normal BSV, abnormal BSV, ARC or suppression. I'd give those again one more time. Yep, so normal BSV, abnormal BSV, ARC, which is abnormal retinal correspondence, or suppression. That's great. Share the results, there you go. Uh, so the majority of you went for option one, so almost 70% option one think the patient's got normal BSV. Now, chances are the patient probably does have normal BSV. Um, now, the reason we're, we're coming to that conclusion is that they've got a good and equal level of vision. They give a binocular response um, or a normal retinal correspondence response on um, baglini glasses. They've got the presence of motor fusion and they've got the presence of stereoacuity. So they've got all three grades of binocular single vision and there's nothing um, from that to suggest that it's abnormal binocular single vision. So they probably have normal um, BSV. So 70% of you are, are probably right. There's a few, few patients never fit the mold, but this patient is likely to have normal binocular single vision. Nice movement. Perfect. Um, so patient two, has a 0.1 vision in the right eye, 0.3 vision in the left eye. They've got a slight left exotropia. They give a cross response in Bagolini glasses. They overcome a 20 and they've got 170 seconds of arc on stereo. So the question is the same if we can reset the poll. Um, so does this patient have normal binocular single vision, abnormal binocular single vision, abnormal retinal correspondence, or suppression. Okay, I think we got cut. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So, um, the results for this one, actually the results for this are quite interesting. So thankfully nobody went for um, normal binocular single vision because with a man his face squint, you're right, it's definitely not normal. Um, the options of abnormal binocular single vision and abnormal retinal correspondence, now technically both can be true, but as a abnormal retinal correspondence is a phrase that would only be used when the patient does not have binocular status. Now, I know that's really confusing and it really throws things in the works, but that, that's just the way uh, the, the dark art of BV works. So the patient has abnormal binocular single vision. It does mean that they have abnormal retinal correspondence, but clinically that's not what you would say the patient has. So people who went for two and three are both correct, but when we use the phrase of abnormal retinal correspondence, we mean in the presence, we mean in the absence of full binocular status, which I said, I know it confuses everybody, but the, the patient doesn't suppress um, because they've got their their cross response and their 20 diopter and their frisbee. Move on to the next one. So patient three has the same vision, 0.1 and 0.3. They've got a small left exotropia and cover test. They have a cross response in Bagolini glasses, but they don't overcome a 20 diopter and they don't have any stereocuity. So the question is the exact same again. So option, um, if we can reset the poll, 
Um, option one will still be normal BSV, option two will be ABSV, option three will be ARC, and option four would be suppression. Just um, bring the results up for that one now. So um, the results for this one are quite interesting as well. So the 46% of you that said that it was option three ARC are absolutely correct. So they do have abnormal retinal correspondence. That's why they still give you a cross response on Bagolini glasses because the two eyes are corresponding to, to each other. They're stimulating um, to non-corresponding points normally, but in this circumstance, they, they correspond to straight ahead. So they give you the cross response, but they don't have full BV developed. Now that's why sometimes Bagolini glasses is perceived as being a test, not of sensory fusion, but just of simultaneous perception. So you just have the ability to perceive the two Im images at the same time. And um, in this case, circumstance, because they both correspond straight ahead, they will be perceived as being on top of each other but they don't have enough uh, binocular vision for it to be deemed ABSV. But because they give you a cross response on bag linear glasses, it's not suppression. If it was suppression, you would only have one line um, corresponding to the eye that they're seeing with um, and the one that's not being suppressed. All right, can we move on, Victoria? Does anybody have any, I'm just going to go on to ocular motility for the last kind of 10 minutes. Does anybody have any questions about that? Or we can, we can leave questions. Uh, there is the, one. Was the yeah. patient, was the patient, what was the patient two result? My signal dropped. Uh, patient two was ABSV. So they've got abnormal binocular single vision. Um, so just a little bit of a reminder of your extraocular muscles and their, their function. So most people remember the primary action of your extraocular muscles, medial rectus adducts, lateral rectus abducts, superior rectus uh, elevates, inferior rectus depresses, your superior oblique is an intorter and your inferior oblique is an extorter. They do, however, have secondary and tertiary actions. Now this is particularly relevant with regards to your oblique muscles because most people think of your superior oblique as its primary function being depression and your inferior oblique as its prim primary function being elevation. But actually, these are secondary actions. Um, and obviously, the, the primary function comes into play when you get cranial nerve palsies, particularly your superior oblique palsies, um, giving you torsion. And the presence of torsion in a superior oblique palsy is really important for differentiating between its between whether it's something that's newly acquired um, or whether it's something that's long-standing. Most patients with a newly acquired palsy of an oblique muscle will complain of torsion. So we're a wee bit uh, more relaxed about things when we hear that the patient doesn't have any torsion. When we, um, when we look at ocular motility in a hospital eye uh, certain, we record ocular motility diagrammatically and we use the terminology that you can see on the screen there. So we would refer to a muscle being weak or underacting and this is usually implying that it's a neurological condition or that it's concomitant, like a habitual weakness, um, which is quite common. You get a habitual weakness of a lateral rectus in an eye that has been, uh, has a concomitant easel just doesn't get used so it becomes eventually a little bit weak. A restriction we would use as um, indicating a mechanical or a myogenic problem so something like an orbital flow fra floor fracture or thyroid eye disease these things um, or um, Duane's retraction syndrome is considered myogenic as well so these kind of things would be called a restriction. Limitation really is a, just another word for something that's iatrogenic or post-operative um, Overaction. Overaction is a confusing one because it's literally anything that overacts. So it doesn't matter whether it's in response to a weakness, a restriction, or a limitation. An overaction is just an overaction. And we check both versions and duction. So when we check the motility, if, for example, you're going out into your, your left gaze, 
when you get the patient to track the fixation torque with both eyes open, you're checking your versions. That's the extent of the movement with both eyes working together. Now, in um, different conditions, the duction movement may be more or less than the version movement, usually more. You sometimes find that in a neurological condition, the version movement is reduced, but the range of the duction movement is better. And that's why if we have, a, for example, a six nerve palsy, once we've checked both eyes together, we would always cover up the, the fixing eye and see if the squinting eye um, can, can abduct any further than what we got on versions. But that gives us an idea of, of whether or not it's neurogenic or mechanical. Um, and we record the, the value in the position of that muscle's action. So we then, we then grade our overactions, underactions, weaknesses, and all those terminologies um, on a scale of plus four to minus four. So zero being normal, as in no problem, minus four being the weakest, restricted, or most restricted that the muscle could be, which in a horizontal deviation means it doesn't move beyond the midline. Uh, so it's fixed in a central position in that position of gaze. Um, and then it goes up to plus four in terms of your, your overactions. Sometimes we might find um, that a patient has an ability to take up central fixation. So you could argue that you also get minus five, six, seven, um, but nobody ever really uses those. Um, but just as a, a marker, a minus one would indicate that there's still 75% of that movement left, minus two, 50% of movement, Minus three, twenty-five percent of movement, and as I said, a minus four means that the that the eye just doesn't move beyond. Um, when we think that a patient has a restriction, we 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 would hash it. So most orthoptists now use diagrammatic, and um, so we would hash it to say that it's a restriction. So that indicates to the next person reading it that we think it's um, a mechanical problem and not a neurogenic problem. If it's an underaction with a number that's recorded without a restriction, then it would indicate that it's likely uh, to be neurogenic. Completely useless. Didn't manage anything except to miss this tutorial. Oh, no. We started at seven. Am I on No, nor am I. All right. Um, so um, when we assess motility, um, we also assess the... Um, it might be worth, um, if anybody's not, could you just check if you're muted, please? Um, I think some people might not be muted. I'll take a look down as well. No, I don't know. It's all right, I've, I've found them. Um, so when we assess ocular motility, we also look at the... We look at the quality of the movements. You want to know, is it a smooth movement or is it jerky? Um, because obviously when you're tracking a fixation target, it should be smooth. Um, so the quality of the movement, you also want to assess whether or not fixation can be maintained once you've got into that position. So it might be that the eye goes round and there's a full extent of movement, but it can't maintain it. We also um, get patients to comment on any discomfort or um, fatigue that they're experiencing as you're uh, assessing their motility. And all of those things help us to form a, a differential diagnosis um, when, we're, when we're assessing ocular motility. Um, can you jump on, uh, Victoria, please? So uh, patient A, um, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples of patients that presented to the, uh, the hospital eye service following um, attending a community optometrist, just as we kind of finish into the um, what we were chatting about. So this was a six-year-old male. Mum had been noticing that one eye looked higher than the other. When they went to the community optician, their cooperation was not great. Um, generally fit and healthy uh, little boy and the optometrist was able to ascertain that it looked like they had a left hypertrophia. Um, they didn't cooperate for very much else. Um, so we didn't get, uh, we don't have an OE, we didn't have a, a retraction. We don't have motility, we just know they have a left hypertropia. So um, this patient was referred uh, via HES um, urgently, um, to HES urgently via Sky Gateway. Um, so I know that one thing that, that optometrists obviously in community might um, find challenging is determining the urgency of the assessment. And these next couple of patients just are a, a wee kind of um, thing, thing with regards to that. So if we pop up the next slide. So I think it went to the optician on the Wednesday. So on the Friday, the patient attends their GP um, complaining of double vision and mum reports um, that he's become lethargic and he's vomiting. The GP contacted 
a CDU. So this was a Lanarkshire patient um, CDU in Lanarkshire is the clinical decisions unit for ophthalmology. It would be uh, the acute referral centre in Glasgow and I'm sure it has a whole host of other names up and down the country depending on where you work but in uh, Lanarkshire it's called the clinical decisions unit and they were referred for um, same day assessment. So they came up to the clinic on the Friday afternoon. Uh, if we pop to the next slide, Victoria. Uh, so it happened to be myself that seen them. I didn't get a lot out of them either, to be honest. Um, I did manage to confirm he definitely has a small left hypertropia and um, a very quick uh, look at his motility revealed that he had um, underaction of both uh, depressors in the left eye and both elevators in the right eye. Now, ideally, in a, an ideal scenario, you have a nice cooperative 35 year old patient in front of you and you can do your parks three step test and decide whether or not they've got an elevator palsy or a superior oblique palsy but in a six year old who barely cooperates for a vision that's that's not happening and um, so at that point we obviously have to make a decision about what we're going to do with this uh, young boy now given the history of double vision which you wouldn't expect in a six year old and the vomiting and the lethargy the patient was um admitted can you pop to the next slide so um, we decided that he likely had a fourth nerve palsy. I uh, couldn't prove it, but we go on a, a, diag a diagnosis that's most likely. And most vertical deviations, don't quote me on this, but most vertical deviations, if it's not mechanical, are a fourth nerve palsy. Not all of them, but that's your, if you're going to guess one, it's the best one to guess. Um, and he also had gaze of open nystagmus. So he got admitted to the paediatric uh, ward at Wisher General. He had a CT scan, which came back as normal. Um, and was discharged from the paediatric ward with 48 hour open access, which is generally what they, what they do there. So basically, if the patients are worried, they can just show back up. Um, now, he was discharged on the Saturday following getting the CT scan on the Saturday morning. He got discharged on the Saturday. Um, now, this chap also then happened to have a, an appointment with the orthoptic clinic on Monday to come back and see us for the attempt to get rid of his double vision because... On a Friday afternoon, our most important thing was getting a scan. Our most important thing wasn't joining up his double vision. So he had an appointment to come back and see us on Monday morning. Now, when he came back to see me on Monday morning, I don't know how uh, anybody else would feel, but I wasn't overly happy that a child with a fourth nerve palsy, which appears to be acquired, and gaze of open nystagmus, got discharged because their CT scan was normal. So he went back and forth several times and eventually he got uh, admitted to the kids hospital in Glasgow and he got sedated, he got anesthetized for an MRI and he turned out he had cerebellitis, um, which thankfully has resolved and they don't know why he had it in the first place. Um, but the vomiting went away, he only had lost appetite, got referred to psychology, was, he, got really, he became very, very distressed, this wee boy. Um, but it's also just demonstrates that his behaviour was actually not you know, it wasn't a behavioural problem. It was all down to how how rubbishy he was feeling on the day. Now, there's no way you could know from the initial presentation that that was going to be a child with cerebellitis that needed urgent admission. Um, it just, you just need to, to watch the clinical picture develop sometimes. Um, move on to next patient. So second patient um, was an 80-year-old female who had a moderate esotropia in the distance with diplopia. She was complaining of, again, this is a real patient, she was complaining of pain and weakness in eye movements, particularly up gaze and lateral gaze. She has a metastatic breast cancer. So the optometrist seeing the patient in this scenario contacted CDU and the clinician doing triage um, brought them up for assessment. Next slide. So, on an uh, orthoptic assessment, they were found to have a minimal esophoria with good recovery. Distance, they had a small esotropia with diplopia. Ocular motility um, kind of fits with what the patient said she found uncomfortable. Um, so she's got bilateral lateral rectus weaknesses of minus one and bilateral elevation weaknesses all the way across minus one. Um, so in this scenario, if we can just do a very quick poll because we're almost done. Obviously, the first one we, we admitted and we were concerned about. Are we equally as concerned about this patient? So does this patient warrant further investigation or are we happy? So yes, we're investigating or no, we're just treating the symptoms and monitoring. So yes, for investigation, no for monitoring. All right. 
result. So again, the, the results um, are quite interesting. So it's a, not quite an even split, but um, more than half say yes to investigation and 37% say no. So we didn't investigate this patient. Um, now, you might ask different, uh, a different department or a different member of staff that was covering the clinic the day that the patient was in. But this patient, um, when, they were, when we measured the patient in different positions, they were found to have a concomitant deviation. So it measured the same looking straight ahead, looking left and looking right, which tells us that these weaknesses of abduction are not new. And they're 80 years old. Most 80 year olds can't look up. Um, so a minus one of elevation across the board in an 80 year old isn't generally something that, that's of concern to us. So this patient was given a prism for symptomatic relief and they were given washing and advice um, and they weren't, um, they weren't investigated further. Now, um, if you, you flip to the next one. So they were just found to have a decompensating divergence weakness, isophoria, age-related weaknesses of motility, given a prism, and we didn't investigate them further. And I'm quite happy to say they didn't show up three days later with uh, washing symptoms. And so far, she's so good. She's, she's still fine. Um, change slide. So uh, with that patient, obviously, the question is really when to prescribe, how much do you give, and when to refer. Um, so that's the type of patient that I would say in community, yeah, give her a prism, um, give her the least amount of prism that you can possibly give to get back into binocular vision and refer if things start to get worse. But um, in this scenario, yeah, you could, you could just dispense some uh, incorporated prism for, for symptomatic relief. Um, Ashley, somebody said that they uh, missed the diagnosis of patient A, I think, from that last section, if you can remember what the result was. Yeah, so they had, um, they had, so they had cerebralitis, which at the time was presumed to be post varicella, um, because the sibling had chicken pox. Now, the wee boy himself didn't uh, have a rash, so didn't have any uh, clinical signs of chicken pox, but they went on a working diagnosis of post varicella cerebralitis. The MRI scan showed um, features consistent with cerebralitis. Um, which is just inflammation of the cerebellum. And the, the cerebellum is really important for coordination of eye movements, which is why it would give nystagmus, but also coordination of uh, movement in general. So it can cause things like ataxia and, and loss of balance. Um, so the, the diagnosis fit, but pre post screen, it actually turned out he didn't have uh, any exposure to chicken pox at all. So they don't know why he had it. All right. So hopefully I've not... Um, bored you all to death and covered things that people um, were intrigued about. If there is anything that I didn't cover that MD wants to know, feel free to, to ask out. If you want to add any, any comments, any questions in the chat box, then I'm happy to go through them just now. Oh, I think we've got one. Um, oh no, thank you. Oh, here we go. Yeah. How long do you keep Fren Fresnel before incorporating into spec lenses? I would generally say a minimum of six months, um, particularly if it is, uh, it depends on a lot of things, um, but I would generally say I would like a patient to be stable for about six months before we would incorporate into it. If they're getting a new pair of glasses anyway, and they're only likely to get worse instead of better then there's probably no harm in putting it in um, it just might mean that it gets worse and we just need to stick more phreno prism on top if it's not going to be any expense to the patient if it's something that's going to be um, of any additional cost to the patient then I would say we need to we do want to know it's stable for about six months before you put it in but if the patient's getting a new pair of glasses anyway and they're definitely going to need prism long term then there's no harm in putting it in straight away Any other questions or does anybody want to shout out? I think that I've must seen be... before that all of the optometrists must be as uh, shy as the orthoptists. They don't shout out either. <laughs> Would you know how we get hold of a Fresnel for a patient? 
Um, if it's a patient that's under the care of the NHS, you should be able to contact the local health board and the local orthopedic department that they attend and get one sent to you. That's not a problem. If it's a non-NHS patient, so they're not currently under the care of an orthopedic department and they need a phrenal prism, you can just purchase them from Hagstripe, um, which the patient can either do themselves or um, you can purchase and then charge the patient for them. I think they're approximately £25 plus VAT, so they're not particularly cheap. Um, especially if they need multiple because they come with their three pairs of glasses and their two pairs of sunglasses that they want one on. Um, but yeah, if the patient's already a, an NHS patient, most, most health boards would be happy to send you one to put on the patient's glasses. Actually, most health boards, if they're accommodating, um, would be happy to send you one to put on a patient's glasses while they're awaiting an appointment as well, if you're uh, comfortable with assessing the strength. Okay, I think that's um, I think that is everything. So thank you so much for that um, presentation, Ashley. That was brilliant. We will have it available um, because I did manage to record it, so it will be available to rewatch if anybody wants to. Um, Please do. <laughs> I'll send you out um, feedback forms hopefully tomorrow um, so that you can complete them and I can then send you your certificate so that you can um, go onto the GOC site and uh, claim your points. But please don't do that until I have had a chance to do all of the background stuff with the GOC because otherwise you won't be able to see the talk. So as soon as you get the certificate, you'll know that it's available. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. Thanks.